Today on Locked On Rockies, there's no better place to get your offseason Rockies ranking than Purple Row. So I brought some of them in, and we're going to rank some Rockies and talk about the offseason all coming up on today's episode of Locked On Rockies. You are Locked On Rockies, your daily Colorado Rockies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On Rockies fans, welcome into today's episode of Locked On Rockies. I'm Paul Holden, your host of Locked On Rockies, joined by two of the best in the biz, two covering Rockies baseball more than just about everyone. They are on the Affected by Altitude podcast, the Every Rocky Ever podcast. They are underneath the umbrella of the Rocky Mountain rooftop, and they're breaking down Rockies coverage on Purple Row all season and off season long. I'm joined by Skylar Timmons and Evan Lang today. Thank you both so much for your time. Yeah, no problem. Good to be back. Yeah, thanks for having us. This Skyler, is a of course, slick intro. Had, yeah, we have Evan <laughs> here making his Locked On Rockies debut. Skyler, of course, has been here. And I, I I made sure I saged the room. No tech issues this time, I hope, as of right now. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to sound like I'm drowning underwater here in our conversation. And um, one thing that I, I like, uh, or one of my favorite things, is uh, people that have listened to the show. Uh, I go to Purple Row weekly uh daily just about especially during the season but right now you guys are breaking down and ranking the rockies and i kind of wanted to start there what do you guys look for when you start this conversation how early does it start out and what are the metrics you use when you are building your rankings for the rockies so it's actually a pretty simple process uh we don't do a lot of we don't deliberate as a a writing staff Uh, we just purely use uh, baseball references version of war and just rank them like that. So, you know, you'll get a Fernando Abad who is ranked way higher in a positive war and you get a, you know, a, a Chris Bryant who's negative and gets ranked worse than for not than that. So there's no deliberation, but we just strictly go just for organizing purposes by war, uh, according to baseball reference makes it a lot easier. Yeah. A lot less arguing. And I mean, You know, say what you will about war, but it's a good benchmark, at least when you're looking at this. And especially when I think you're 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 breaking down the Rockies. So at the bottom of our list here, kind of the usual suspects. And I want to focus on on one that you guys have already talked about, because some of the players that you've already covered aren't on the team anymore. And one that is arbitration eligible. And I talked about this week, Harold Castro, the the Rockies can't be bringing back Harold Castro. Right. I mean, if if, it's just play Alan Trejo, right? Like, I mean, why, if you, if Brendan Rogers is healthy and he's going to be every day, I'm very happy. Personally, I'm very happy with Alan Trejo being the Rockies backup infielder in general. Are, are they going to go back to Castro? I know Skyler, I believe I was uh, reading your piece there and you were not very, uh, you weren't very confident that they were going to bring back Harold. No. And this is something Evan and I have talked about a lot too, where Harold Castro just wasn't valuable. What was he was just pure awful. No, but he was thrown into an everyday starting role this season. And it just sowed a lot of the holes of, yeah, this guy's probably his best value would have been off the bench, but he was a starting guy most of the year and just didn't bring any value to the team. You know, he survived the entire season, played what about a hundred games and still just no value whatsoever. So it, so it, Really tough to think that they bring him back at 30 years old for close to $2 million. I don't know Evan has a lot more thoughts on Harold Castro, but yeah, you hung, it, you hung your head see. there, right? As soon as I said Harold Castro, not, not a lot of love for hitting Harold Castro. So what's really funny is I actually do really like Harold Castro. I think he's a fun guy. Everyone says he's a great teammate, but just one of the many problems with the Rockies this year came with that roster construction. And we all kind of knew the moment that Harold got his spring training invite, that minor league deal. Oh, he's probably making the roster. And then he really just ended up playing way too much. Um, Him being on the roster delayed guys like Brenton Doyle coming up for a little bit. When um, we had those injuries at center field, Uh, he played some second base in place of Brendan Rogers. But really, there were so many other guys, and there still are so many other guys who can play that middle infield utility role. And 
for for Castro's performance this year, it just wasn't. It's not good enough for as many games as he played, where he had one of the lowest wars by both Baseball Reference and by Fangraphs in the league, and he was still regularly playing past the trade deadline, and. We saw really weird stuff happen, like when uh, Coco Montez was designated for assignment. You know, Coco's the guy who can play third, second, and short. He can't play center field like Castro can, but center field is now locked down at this point. So it was just, it's really odd that he survived the entire season because you either are going to non-tender him, and then you've had a guy who put up negative, what, what was it, negative 1.4 at the end of the season? Yeah negative 1.4 war at the end of the season and you get rid of him and okay so why did you play him so much last year or you keep him and you're paying 1.8 million dollars to a guy who put up negative 1.4 war last season and it's like honestly i would have much rather had garrett hampson this year still than harold castro yeah and, and, and on top of that again i think alan trejo is uh is someone that is still interesting still provides way more of an interest especially at, like you said after the trade deadline it, it really should have just been anyone you want to see more and yeah we're, we're not necessarily overly confident that harold cash is going to be back and really again negative war expensive uh, the rockies could go amador if they're in a, sim a similar situation so I i'm right there with you there were a couple of other names who was the rocky that you guys have reviewed so far that you were most disappointed in to this season and, and most disappointed to find them at the bottom of the list i i jerks and profar is a name that comes up just because i was hoping for a bounce back fun you know he mm -hmm. was he did have a smile and he was fun but woof some of that stuff is there someone that uh, that you guys have found surprising that's on the bottom of the list i i want to say chris bryant but i'm not surprised to see that's where he ended up after how much he played this year yeah that's probably the big one for a lot of people is chris bryant you know on our list coming in at number 52 uh this list starts at a weird number of 57 rockies this season so he comes <laughs> so in at number rockies. 52 and it's just disappointing and our buddy mac covered that that article it's just disappointing with that contract, what we expect Chris Bryant to be, but still injuries are a problem. And then when he was healthy, played in 80 games this year, so double what he did, and still not producing to the level we want him to or that he's capable of. So that one's pretty disappointing for me. Uh, yeah, and a, a huge chunk of that negative war for KB, um, baseball references war really heavily um, puts defense as part of it. And that, that's another reason um, Jerks and Profar's war was so bad is that defensively they were just not good. And we saw KB be moved from left field to right field this year, but he still wasn't very good in right field. And I think how poorly he played as an outfielder definitely affected how low that ranking is. Because if you just look at his batting for the 80-something games he played, it's perfectly fine, all things considered. Mm -hmm. and it's not if the it, it's it, it's chris bryant man <laughs> it's, it's just <laughs> like that, that's how i feel it's like oh yeah you know the bats like kind of still there but the power dip is so concerning where it's just like really next year i just want to see him play 120 games i'm uh, yeah. you know and, and that's uh, that's 42 games he's not playing i'm already factoring in a a sore back in a in a five game il stint and you know i i have no faith in chris bryant playing a full healthy season next year what do the rockies do with chris bryant i mean nolan jones and brenton doyle are, are clearly the the thing in the outfield there's uh, you know you can flirt with potentially veen coming up and and just you got charlie blackman again in right field and I don't know, man. I, I can't be. I, how long until we sit there and saying KB stealing at bats from Montero? We can't be. We can't may have him playing first base and DHing. Mm -hmm. I think next year what's going to be big is, I think Chris Bryant is done playing in the outfield. I think they've shown that by um, at the end of the season transitioning him over to first base. I think it's going to be really similar to what Chuck does right now of just bouncing back and forth between that position and DH. So if Chuck's in right field, then KB's at DH and montero or whomever is it is it first base i wrote about uh i wrote about this a couple months ago that kb 
in order to have a successful season next year, he really does need to play at least 100 games. He needs to get back up there and he needs to get healthy because he's shown that he actually does still have some decent pop once he gets a rhythm. But when you're hurt constantly, you're never going to find that rhythm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's let's that's on full display, I think, at the beginning of the seasons when we're seeing the Rockies come out and, and the beginning of this year, the first two weeks of the season were good. They the Rockies were playing good baseball, led by KB's not driving it out of the yard, but liners, you know, even the soft liners that he's hitting into into the outfield were at least getting runners on, but then everything's fall apart. And like you said, with no consistency with KB, there's no real Rockies fans can't even form anything. Like, I don't have a Chris Bryant Rockies memory yet. <laughs> Every time he's, it's like, here it is. He's coming up and poof. Like, I, I just, I really hope it does come to, uh, you know, it benefit a little bit more because that tie up, especially with the prospects and the players that you have, that's going to be a factor. Uh, I want to shift from their rankings because, again, they're still going through them, and I didn't want to spoil too much. I want to go and focus on to what you guys think the Rockies will do this offseason and revisit the first move of the offseason in bringing back Charlie Blackman coming up here in segment number two. But before we do that, don't miss out on the daily fantasy baseball action with Sleeper. All the playoff action is going on right now, and if you want to get in on the fun, you can pick a, line, a couple of players that you like, maybe your favorite players, postseason performers maybe you want to ride the bryce harper train i don't know you can check it all out at sleeper and all you got to do is pick more or less on stats like home runs hits strikeouts and more for an up to 100 times payout on sleeper get your picks right and you could win big when you use sleep uh when you use sleeper and you head to sleeper.com don't miss out on the promo code for us that's locked on and you'll get a hundred dollar match on your first deposit that's promo code locked on and you'll get a hundred dollar match on your first deposit at sleeper terms and conditions do apply see sleepers terms of use for details we are here on the locked on rockies podcast joined by two very special guests today skylar timmons and evan lang evan below me here if you're on the youtube and skylar over to uh my what is is that stage right but left technically there i was not in not in the theater there so i'm i'm not not sure if i nailed that one um but purple row affected by altitude every rockies ever i talk a lot of rockies baseball not as much as these guys and so we were talking about purple rose ranking the rockies and the rockies are kind of disappointed they're going into this offseason, which is going to be really interesting because it's a team that's going to be a lot younger. We have a lot different faces. It's not going to be what's CJ Crone's role going to be and, and Randall Gritchick. We're really going to see kind of the wonder is what steps forward are these young Rockies going to take? But this team's got to supplement that pitching staff. And this team still has a couple of holes here and there. What do the Rockies do this offseason to address their needs? And can they convince people to come pitch here, especially starters? Because Herman and Antonio are what, at earliest pitching in August, July, maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's going to be the big thing. And I think we got a glimpse of that at the uh, at the trade deadline. You know, we've talked about that before. But it seems like that's going to be the, the main goal going into the offseason is, okay, how do we supplement the starting pitching and make sure we have enough to get us through the year, you know, at least at the big league level especially. So that's why we might see a Chase Anderson come back again. You know, maybe Chris Flexen, they figure out a way to keep him again and tie block. You know, they might stick with what they have in-house already, what they're familiar with. And then I think the trade market is, is really going to be that best option going forward of bringing in starting pitching. If you can't sign the free agents – well, then you're going to have to acquire them against their will and bring them in, so to speak. You know, last season, we had that rumor of, of Brendan Rodgers over to the Marlins for Edward Cabrera. Maybe they revisit that. Maybe Brendan Rodgers gets moved, and then that opens up more room for other prospects. But it's they've got to look at trades and moving either prospects that they just are log jammed. So if Chris Bryant's going to be playing first base, maybe Montero gets put on the put on the plate or Michael Tolia and see what they can bring in of controllable pitching. That's ready for the big leagues. Yeah, it really is at best right now. We're looking at a rotation of Austin Gomber, Kyle Freeland, um, probably Ty block and chase Anderson and an open number five spot. Uh, Ryan Feltner, if that uh, arm recovers, which hopefully it does little, uh, a little too nervous about that one with the amount of Tommy John that was on this team last year. But you know, Skyler's absolutely right, is that I think 
any pitching that we bring in is going to have to come on the the trade market. And there's a handful of guys that you could definitely look into dealing for either AAA pitching or major league pitching. Do the Rockies make that move? Does it require them to be in the same spot that they're in at the trade deadline? Because I don't see a Brendan Rodgers trade happening in the offseason. I, I believe that they want him to be on their opening day roster and, and, and still high, hold him in high regard. But Seattle's going to be looking for a second baseman. Yeah. They got pitching pro. I mean, Miami's looking for, you know, will always be looking for, for offensive talent. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not ruling out. I'm very high on Brendan Rodgers, but so do you think the Rockies make that trade in the off season or these, these big trades are going to come closer to the deadline? I feel like the Rockies MO is they're weird with trades. That's the hard thing. Well, especially after this year, how are we supposed to feel? Yeah. This was a lot of trading they did with Bill Schmidt. That it, I mean, even before the season trade deadline, I mean, it is kind of a, I, I feel like I haven't seen the Rockies make this many deals in a calendar yeah. year before. What it I always think you have. Yeah. What I always think it is, is they're not going to, ever since Nolan Arnauto, they're not going to try to make the big splash trade. We're going to see probably what they did last year of those little minor trades of, well, Sam Hilliard's gone now. Car- Connor Joes, we're sending him away and trying to just amass pitching like that. But they've been doing that kind of thing most of their history, and we see where the results have been, especially in the pitching department. So maybe they can you know, look outside of themselves and realize, okay, we have this player that we've got plenty of position players. Amador is almost ready. We've got Sterling Thompson who's making his way. He can play second base for the time being. Maybe a guy like Brendan Rodgers could go on the block because he'll bring us the best return. Well, if they want to keep him around, that's great. they got to figure out other ways then to, to bring in that talent to improve their system. Yeah, the Rockies, they especially with prospects, they tend to hold on very, very tight to prospects they're high on. But they're going to have to let some of these guys go if they want to try and trade for more pitching. Guys like... Um, Aaron Schunk, if you don't think that he's going to play on your big league team, see if you can get something for him and trade him to someone who will give him that playing opportunity. Same for maybe Michael Tolia, like Skyler mentioned earlier. I think Tolia is the prime trade yeah. prospect right now. I think the Rock- the Rockies can't aff- – I don't know. Can they afford to – trade Montero now with Gomber being like, yeah, we kind of know what we're getting, but Montero's showing those flashes of the power that could be really great for cores. So I'm wondering if Tolia is going to be the one we talked, we talked Rogers, we talked prospects. We didn't mention a certain third baseman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no one <I mean>, Jones. <laughs> well, I mean, it can it mean, would the Rockies be crazy enough to bring Chris, Br- you know, if they're liking Montero, would they put him at third again and, and, and send Rymac off to, to something there? Someone that's got a little bit of, he's got a couple of years of control. Doesn't he? Rymac's got a couple of years uh, under a deal that doesn't uh, on his extension. Mm-hmm. Still a two, three, something like that. After that, I'm just curious if that maybe be a move for the Rockies. Cause in the back of my mind, you, you guys nail it. I think the only way to really bring in big name pitching is going to be through trades but i feel like this rockies team is going to sit there and say hey we really like having four potential gold glovers in our infield i mean or three i I rather with rogers mcmahon and ezekiel tovar who i think deserves to be in the conversation of a top defender after his first season Mm -hmm. my my thought going into this offseason is that pretty much anybody most anybody and everybody can be on the table Uh, now a lot of those people won't be but if you get a really good offer, if somebody comes and blows you out with an a awesome offer for Ryan McMahon of, hey, we're going to give you, you know, this big league rating starter who's pretty good uh, and some of these other prospects or something, if you come with a good deal or figure out something that's a good beneficial deal for both parties, yeah, you can, you can pull the trigger on that because it's always the Rockies have no shortage of good defensive you know, infielders and hitters. There's a position player wise, they're usually pretty good. It's just a matter of finding playing time for guys. But it's the anything you can do to bring in pitching, I think, would be beneficial. Now, do you want to get rid of Ryan McMahon because that glove is so valuable and he does have that offensive potential if he can just figure out how to tap into it consistently? It's perfect to keep him around. 
but there's always all those other things to consider. Yeah, what's tough is that McMahon's bat was was really inconsistent this year. You know, he hit 23 home runs, but he also struck out some of the most in the big leagues, almost 200 strikeouts, most strikeouts on the team. Uh, it was it was tough sometimes because there's a, a clear hole in his swing. And if you can repair that hole, if you can get him hitting like he should, then he is someone you definitely don't want to let go. But at the same time, it feels like every year we've been saying this is the season that Ryan McMahon needs to break out offensively. Yeah, and, and how long do we continue to do that? Because man, mm-hmm. it ain't just him, man. This whole team needs to cut down the strikeouts immensely. They, I mean, the, you're just watching these playoff teams, the at-bats they have, and it's just like, I, how many 10-pitch at-bats did the Rockies have this year? You know, the, like without them going down on three straight strikes. I, that's something they got to address. And, and, and as we go through it, we've talked players. Does this team make any changes to personnel-wise? Why does Daryl Scott get to continue to just sit here comfortably in his job as this pitching staff you mentioned you 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 briefly touched on that evan the pitcher health this year that has to be something there needs to be some questions about that because multiple tommy johns across multiple levels i I just don't sit here and, and and realize like bud black honestly i can be whatever about at this point i don't necessarily i think his loyalty to veterans is his biggest flaw as we've as we've highlighted mm-hmm. through this episode and his willingness to say harold castro's my guy he's got to get out there for 100 <laughs> games this year that's probably his biggest flaw but I, I don't necessarily know if a new manager changes the rockies fortunes that much but man with the offense striking out as much as it did and the pitching staff stepping backwards and getting less healthy when are Rockies coaches going to be with a little fire under them I wish I had the answer for that Paul it's some that we're always it's hard to tell with the Rockies because you never know if somebody's on the hot seat just with how insular and how loyal you know Dick Monfort is to a fault no he's loyal in good ways to people when he should be but he's loyal to people when he shouldn't be and we've seen that problems all the way all the way through the front office and managing staff where we don't fire people we mutually agree to part ways you know we haven't fired a manager since clint hurdle yeah. or and we'll part way maybe they'll address personnel like they did with dave magadan last season offensively and then they bring in bam bam maybe they finally look at daryl scott yeah you've been here in this organization for a while but it's just not working here at the big league level we want to look at a different way. That'd be great, but you can never tell with the, with the Rockies. That's the problem. Yeah, and I think part of it also, it needs to be a, another fresh look at what this organization is doing training-wise and development-wise across all levels of the organization because you know we had five guys have Tommy John surgery basically the same week. Antonio Sensatella and four different minor league pitchers, including Gabriel Hughes, our top prospect uh, pitching wise. But I really do think this team needs to take a look at the major league pitching staff as a whole. We've talked about this on our show before, but there's a pretty clear disconnect between what people are doing in the minors and what people are doing in the majors in terms of pitching philosophy. Yeah, it's 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 I the organization. It's like there's players to like about the Rockies, but again, you can't sit here and be confident because it all goes back to Dick, and it all goes back to thirty years of mostly incompetence from the Rockies. And and I'm and I'm not afraid to use those words because we're gonna get fed the same spoonful of, of BS and leading into the season. We're gonna play five hundred ball. We're gonna blah blah blah. While the Diamondbacks just swept away the Dodgers, the Giants are always looming. The Padres are certainly going to be looking for the thing, and the Dodgers will continue to be a machine. I I just don't know how the Rockies just put their blinders up so much to the rest of Major League Baseball. I I preach it all the time. The Rockies are desperate for people to come from outside of the organization that want to, and I say it, weaponize Coors Field. Make it the worst place for any team to come through, especially with all these teams that never uh, don't play at Coors Field multiple times a year. The Dodgers and the NLS is one thing, but the Mariners got to roll through Coors Field from time to time. You know, make it a pain to do that. And, And that stuff matters. And I just don't think the Rockies do enough of it. So 
We, we were hitting the, the negative stuff. Let's hit some favorite moments. Let's brighten things up. It is a Friday podcast after all. We do get to celebrate the Dodgers having the same amount of playoff wins as the Rockies in 2023. So we'll do that and more coming up here on today's episode of Locked on Rockies. But October baseball is back and it is in full swing. Don't miss out on all the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Join FanDuel today and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and create your new account. Then you can get in on the action from the first pitch until the final out. Bet on everything from strikeouts to home runs to who will win the game. And if you don't want to wait the whole game to get a W, predict what will happen in the next at-bat with quick bet. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on right now. Step up to the plate this postseason. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. We are joined by Skylar Timmons and Evan Lang. Purple Row, affected by altitude, every Rockies ever. All sorts of great coverage. You know we read Purple Row all the time over here on the Locked on Rockies podcast. Uh, let's do two quick things to wrap up the show here today. We didn't talk about it in the segment before, but... I'm pretty excited about the Charlie Blackman deal. I, I I actually think this is with the especially because of the way he played post injury. DH is going to work. Are you guys happy with one more year of Charlie Blackman? Yes, I'm. I'm delighted. Like I am on. I was honestly shocked with the some of the negative reception this deal got. I get that it is somewhat of a large contract, but I've said it before that sometimes you're paying guys as a reward for everything earned, they've done for the organization money, for sure absolutely and he played extremely well this year in limited playing time you know i don't think he's ever going to be the same home run home runner hit home run hitter as he was before but he's shown that he still has gas in the tank the fact that he still hit a bunch of triples this year yeah old man's got wheels and especially if next year is his last season i think it would be so much better for him to actually have a true last ride versus this year where he missed a bunch of the season due to injuries. And it was the worst season in franchise history. And everybody was miserable. Like he deserves that you let him have that final year. If this is really going to be the end. And then at the end of that year, you hoist that number, hum, that number 19 right on up there next to 17 and 33. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's we've talked about it before too. He's the perfect, you need that leadership with this young core coming in and growing up. You need a veteran like Charlie Blackman. He's embraced that role. He's accepted that role as the new Todd Helton of this generation of Rockies. He's assumed that role, and he, you know, he's okay with it being Chuck's children. No, Chuck and the children. He's okay with that, and he wants to be here around those guys. And, hey, some they need a leadoff hitter, and who better than Chuck Nasty when he's probably not out running around in a ghillie suit down in south, <laughs> southeastern Colorado in those mountains if you saw that video. But. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's actually that. That wasn't color. That's, that's a good point. It probably was Chuck running around out there, running around in yeah. a suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chuck. He he's the right guy. He's Mister Rocky and, and Evan. You you nailed it. Ain't no one wearing that number ever again. And if they do, that's a big time mistake. What were your guys? A, a tough year, man. And and you guys do more coverage than I. I, I. I do it, but you guys are writing. You guys are going to games. You guys are doing a heck of a lot. You guys are covering minors all the way down to developmental leagues and fall leagues. Tell me what your your highlights were this season. Me, I'll just. Nolan Jones and Ezekiel Tovar, the whole experience was great for me. Uh, and and I got to see Elias Diaz hit that home run in the All-Star game live, and it was awesome. So that one will forever be great. Do you guys have some moments in, in, a, in a really tough year for the Rockies? What were the ones that stuck out to you guys that, that you enjoyed about, about this club? Hmm. Let Evan go first. <laughs> um, so you already mentioned Ezekiel Tovar and Nolan Jones. Uh, I really want to continue to highlight just what a, for lack of a better word, revelation having Brenton Doyle out in center field was this year. The best out defensive center field season in Rockies history. Uh, the folks who run the um, the Fielding Bible mentioned that before, before Brenton Doyle, Rockies center fielders had only combined for a positive de- run, defensive run save season one time previously. And this year... Brenton puts up 19. 
And his bat turned around. His bat was tough, especially yes. early in the season. But he made these, and Skyler addressed in one of his articles, he made these mechanical adjustments that really did make a difference. Got him over 200 for his batting average. He hit double-digit home runs. And then that's the biggest one right there. The double digit home runs for Brenton Doyle. That's the, that's the, I think one of the key points there. And actually I did, we did a whole episode reading from Skyler's piece about uh, Brenton Doyle's offense. So, but uh, I, I think that's a key part point right there. Not only was it Doyle's, I mean, that defense, man, we haven't, I mean, we've never seen that level of defense, but to have an exciting center, someone that you're confident there, you haven't felt this confident as center fielder since Dexter Fowler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where, you know, Sexy Dexy was really the last really good center fielder this team had. And Brenton Doyle is better. And if he can just get his bat to league average, he's going to have a special career. And then I was at game 162 this year, um, going into extras, having uh, Doyle do the steal and then get home on the wild pitch to to end the game and walk off. That was a really, really fun way to end what had been a very difficult season. Go out on a high note. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think for me, it, it boils all down to just Nolan Jones. Ever since that trade happened, I've been high on Jones. Wanting, I thought he was going to do special things. And the way it turned out for him, who could have imagined a 2020 season for him uh, and, and all the outfield assists with the defense. But the thing that boils down to me is that that very first, I think, walk-off home run for Nolan Jones – Oh, in that game, it got rained at the rain delays, <laughs> took forever. And they're like rushing to, we need to get on a plane to head out to Boston, I think. So they're waiting at Coors Field. And then Nolan Jones hits the walk off dinger. And just every time Nolan Jones hit a home run, it was just a beauty to watch his power, the distance on them. He's just an amazing athlete. And then to boot, he's playing an incredible defense you know, in the outfield with more room to grow. So. No, Joe has that mojo, and yeah. he's he's a new favorite player for me. The fact that he is relatively new at playing the outfield and did as well as he did, yeah, outfield outfield defensively. Plus, he's got a pretty nice swing for just the the sheer power that he can muscle out of a hit. Like when he was cranking out those home runs, it really felt like everyone was just going a thousand feet. Yeah, he it's a it's a it's a quick swing. It's got plenty of pop and pop. He kind of gives me Trevor Story vibes a little bit, where he, you can tell that when when he gets a hold of one, he just gets a hold of one. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and it and it didn't pan out, but and it's been a player that I think got a lot of criticism. But I think Austin Gomber deserves some flowers for his performance this year. It wasn't great or dominant, but I'm glad Austin Gomber was able to be himself and kind of go out in the, in some moments and and say. Hey, you can see the, I mean, this matters to him, man. Like being a good pitcher for the Rockies matters for him because he knows, you know, he's talked about the trade and everything. So I know the back and I know the ERA and everything, but there was that stretch there where Austin Gomber was really shoving for the Rockies. And, and I think that's something we to, to give some flowers to. Well, hopefully a lot more positive uh, for the Rockies next year, but uh, this was a positive time. This was a great time. Hopefully not the last time here. want to have you guys back on once we start bringing in the, the rank in the Rockies, the the fun Rockies to talk more about <laughs> to dive deeper into that. But uh, Skyler, Evan, uh, where can people go to stay up to date with everything that you guys do and, and make sure they they're following your guys's coverage all season and off season long? Yeah, you can find me over on X or Twitter <laughs> X, Twix, whatever the heck they're calling it. Uh, you can find me at sideline underscore crowd. Always posting stuff there and all the articles. Uh, you can also follow every Rocky ever. It's every R O C K I E ever. Uh, we just had an episode where we talked to Brandon Barnes, former Rocky alpha. That was a fun conversation talking more about those rookies we just mentioned too. Uh, so you can follow that for all that content. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Evan underscore Lang two seven. Uh, also on blue sky at, at Evan Lang two seven dot BSKY dot social trying to get a blue sky up for um, Rocky mountain rooftop as well. But currently Rocky mountain rooftop is on Twitter at, at Rocky mountain rooftop. That's at R O C K Y M T N rooftop. Same as on YouTube. If you want videos of our podcasts and things like that, and then you can find both of us just continuing to plug away over at purple 
Two of the best in the business. Thank you both so much for your time. Make sure you check us out on your favorite streaming services. All of the podcasts, Locked on Rockies, Affected by Altitude, every Rocky ever, on your favorite streaming services, on YouTube. Your subscription to all of those channels helps all of us. And guys, thank you so much. And until next time, we'll talk to you later on the Locked on Rockies podcast.